Hey, hey, welcome to Page Break. I'm your host, Brian McClellan, coming to you at the beginning of what looks to be a major snowstorm here in the mountains of Utah. This is your last warning for the Kickstarter for Montego, my first Glass Immortals novella. Montego tells the story of a young peasant boy and his arrival in the capital of the mighty Osun Empire, his conflict with the powerful guild families, and his desire of becoming his own man as a cudgelist in the Empire's deadly spectator sport. The Kickstarter ends on the morning of December 8th and lets you get the novella well before it comes out on normal platforms. Now, on with the show. My guest this week is the prolific, award-winning science fiction and fantasy author Adrian Tchaikovsky. Adrian is known for his early epic fantasy, Shadows of the Apt, and for his lauded Children of Time series, the third book of which should be out by the time this podcast airs. He's also got the brand new standalone City of Last Chances and a whole massive backlist of novels and short stories. Adrian and I chat about his early career in the British legal system, our experiences transitioning to full-time authors, and the way external conditions affect our writing. We also talk about Adrian's interest in zoology and the role insects played in his writing, as well as the tropes in epic fantasy that irritate us. We touch on propaganda, tribalism, and human psychology. Enjoy my chat with Adrian Tchaikovsky. So, Adrian, I uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you about was where does a science fiction fantasy author intersect with a legal executive? <laughs> um, in the realms of random chance, mostly. So, the, how how all this how all this came about was was um, I out of university um, um, with a very a pretty poor degree and a very rough jobs market. I was basically in a position to take whatever was going. I ended up getting a job. Well, I got a job first with an institution called the Intervention Board, which was a government agency doing agricultural compensation during the BSE crisis, um, which involved bundles of forms coming in from abattoirs frequently caked in presumably infected cow blood, um, at which job I stuck out for two weeks before (laughs) giving my notice. after which I ended up at a place called the Legal Aid Board, which is another gov- government agency dealing with um, legal compensation for sort of for cases where people can't afford their own um, their own lawyers. Um, they were changing computer systems and had an enormous backlog of cases they absolutely needed to process, and therefore they were hiring absolutely anyone who turned up off the street. Um, that kind of opened my eyes to think, oh, there is this whole legal world out there. So when that began to pall after a couple of years. I got a job as a legal secretary, and this is kind of where it intersects with writing because I got the job of the legal secretary because I had a very good typing speed and nothing else to recommend me, and somehow that worked. Um, and then I kind of trained up on the job as a legal as a legal executive, which for people who don't know is effectively a junior and quite specialised type of type of lawyer is is that kind of like a, an administration thing going through paperwork and stuff like that um you can be an assistant to someone else but you're also the, effectively you have um limited what are called rights of audience so i could do certain types of cases just on my own um so it's anything that's uh, not in open court so uh oh god i mean i used to do employment cases and then i did you know small debt cases landlord and tenant but it's it's you you basically get to do the the less serious and less valuable uh, less valuable stuff on your own, or you can basically just go along as the sort of paper shuffler for someone more senior. Was it was it a kind of work that you enjoyed, or was it just kind of work that you had? I mean, I enjoyed some of it. I mean, I've I've worked in three three set different firms, and there was an okay firm, and then there was a frankly powerfully unpleasant firm to work in, and then there was a very pleasant firm last off uh, to work in with some very pleasant people. But the work was. 
stressful and I was getting to that point where, I mean, I, I still get, um, even though I've been, I've been about three years now, full-time writing, writing and entirely on my own recognizance. I still get the Sunday evening dreads about the new, the work week starting and things like that. So I'm, I'm, I think it wasn't it, uh, uh, the, the stressful and fa- fairly high pressure nature of it and the, the consequence of getting things wrong. Which you know, which frankly did, did occasionally happen, was starting to get get to me, and I'm powerfully glad that I was able to. Um, I was doing well enough as a writer to go go full time. And and throughout this whole, for at least most of your career, you were also writing on the side, either amateur or professional, right? Um, well, I mean, for, for all I, I was, I was, um, yeah. I mean, I was, I was, I was writing. I was trying to get published for about fifteen years, and then. It must have been a good sort of 10 years in print before I basically looked at the finance and thought, right, there's enough money in the kitty to go a couple of years if everything absolutely crashes. And at that point, I, I'll, I'll two years should be enough to get some sort of other gainful employment. So I'll give it a go. When you were kind of looking at that decision, was the uncertainty of kind of, of, of trying to strike out as a writer, d- did you feel like that you had had enough experience in the field to say, okay, I've got a pretty good idea of what my finances are going to look like versus kind of the, the uncertainty of, oh, publishing is a quite a volatile place to hang your hat. Um, and I, I have a good job. Like was that decision? How, how did you balance that decision? Um, it very much came, came down to, to the, to the two, two years, basically to that kind of safety net. Um, I mean, at that time, obviously, you know, children of time had come out and was doing very well and we were still very much on and up and, you know, there were, we knew there were book contracts in the, in the pipeline. We knew there were, there were sort of sections of advance still to be paid. So, but it's like you say, it is a very volatile business, um, I think that unless you're actually at the Stephen King level, even very successful authors have a certain number of books that don't sell before you start slipping down the the kind of the ladder of publishing. And I've always kind of been aware aware that I'm by no means bulletproof, and at some point I'm sure it will all fall over. So it was very much look, we we are doing well enough at the moment. We've got a certain trajectory and momentum that means we've got a few years of doing okay, and we've got a certain amount of money if things don't go okay. So it's a a gam- It's a very very kind of educated gamble at that point. But it, you know, it was very much it was myself and my wife sitting uh, sitting down and looking at the figures and saying, right, we can do this. Yeah, because we're both, I think, fairly. Um, sort of financially cautious people. I, uh, I kind of had, um, my, my experience with that was that I hadn't actually built a career yet and, uh, like a, like a real job kind of thing. And so I was still making, you know, minimum wage practically, uh, when my contract came through and, and I was able to just say, Oh, you know what? I am already so poor. <laughs> that if this is a disaster. It's not going to affect me too much. And, uh, and then, you know, you, I, I, at least for me, I just, it was, it was scramble, scramble, scramble for gosh, the, probably the first six years of my career. And then, uh, I don't know. I sometimes wonder if I lost a little bit of an edge of not making myself be on top of things constantly. Cause I'm so worried about that collapse. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's interesting. Cause I mean, there are still, there are, I mean, it's one thing, uh, Gene, Gene Wolf, who was of course a fantastically successful writer. He, um, continued to hold down a regular job for, I think, um, his, his entire career as a, I think a technical writer as well. And he very much, he was very keen on the benefits of that as just giving extra input into your life that gives you, um, inspiration to write. And I can certainly, I can certainly see that you have to find some other way, uh, some other sort of input to keep the, the mills of the mind turning. But yeah, I think that there's, I guess he was probably happier with his job than a lot of people. And a lot of jobs have an awful lot of dead time, um, whether it's the commute or whether it's just meetings. Um, they are, I mean, one of the, <laughs> one of the things that's come out of the lockdown is that actually you don't need to do all of that stuff in the office. Most, an awful lot of jobs can just be done at home in half the time. And there is simply an awful, a, simply a lot of managerial plate spinning going on that nobody needs to do. And s- Jobs are also obviously an enormous source of um, stress, and all, although there is that archetype of the the tormented artist who's kind of uh, at their best as a writer when they are under the under the worst kind of 
psychic misery possible. I don't think that's true. And I think that stress takes away from, from the creative effort. Certainly, I mean, extreme stress can leave you completely paralyzed. Yeah, there, there's definitely like a, there's like a knife's edge there. You know, like if I'm a little bit, if I'm a little bit you know, kind of pushed for time or um, a little bit worried, it can give me like an extra boost and I can, I can write a little faster and I can get things done a little bit more efficiently. But if I go over that a little too much, <laughs> then like you said, it's paralyzed and that can be rough. Did, did you find that, did you find that your kind of day job um, drew, drew away now that you've spent three years working full time as an author, did, did you find that your day job looking back, drew away from your creativity or kind of that kind of that well that you have or did it give to it do you feel like it was a benefit or a kind of a detractor from getting your writing done every day i mean my 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 writing output has increased by about say 30 to 50 percent um now that i don't have the day job and it's not it's not that i'm writing every hour of the day um it's because they're the limit to what i can do in a day before i kind of i i, I run dry and just have to let let things recharge and recuperate but i can do more than i was doing and i do and i think also i then have the time when i'm not writing it does mean i can deal with all the little sort of admin details deal with you know editing and the publicity stuff and whatever else that I, is being thrown at me in a way that's not actually eating into actual writing time, which is obviously a benefit. But I, I was kind of wondering. I mean, like, yeah, because with specific reference to 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 Wolf, really, I was wondering whether I, you know, after a six months out of the job, I'd just be there staring at the wall, thinking I have no ideas now, and that has not happened. And I, I, I'm not. I've sped up. I haven't slowed down. So I, I don't think the job was really sort of inspiring me on a creative level at all um i miss the reading time weirdly that i got going on the train uh, i've had to manufacture reading time in my routine with that gone and honestly that's the, that's been the main hit i i noticed that during the pandemic when my amount of driving around you know went from i don't know whatever it was 10 hours a month or whatever dropped to practically zero um I definitely noticed that as like something that that I lost because just driving around is driving is for me one of the times that I am the most creatively active because I, I've got to be engaged with the road, but I'm not, you know, your brain's not a thousand percent there. Mm -hmm. And and so you're you're able to kind of just daydream and process through things in a way that like when I'm at home, there's so many distractions you know, there's video games I want to play. There's, you know, my wife wants to talk to me. The pets want attention. You know, there's all sorts of little things. And so, like, I, I definitely feel like I lost something when I stopped driving as much. Yeah, it's interesting because I used, uh, bef before the lockdown, I would always go out of the house to write. I'd go to a cafe somewhere and, um, you know, get some coffee and write. And again, you, you know, you're, you're cut off from the, the home internet and all of its many, um, all of his many temptations, but I did find that when that came round and I was kind of stuck in the house for a, um, a year and a bit, um, then yeah. Okay. If I'm, that's what I'm doing, I can just sort of knuckle down and get things done. I mean, I, I think I, I am very kind of internalized in the way my mind works. I don't tend to link to places as much. So I think a lot of what I need to do, I, it just kind of happens in a way that's quite detached from my surroundings. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I'm very lucky. I mean, during the during the lockdown, my output went up. I know an awful lot of writers uh, who found it incredibly difficult to get anything done. Just, and I think it's because I also I retreat further into myself when I'm under stress in that way. So that writing became an escape, an escape activity for for me um, because of the the general awfulness that was going on outside. I I think I um I don't think the amount that I wrote dropped at all during the pandemic but i i think that the quality definitely dropped because i found myself i feel like i may have even found myself writing more and discarding way more mm -hmm. like just looking at stuff and saying i'm not happy with that and throwing it out um and uh, and i'm not even sure that stopped I'm, I'm working on the second book in my current series at the moment and i just 
I looked back and I've, I've thrown out something like close to 300,000 words over the last year, just Blimey. incredibly unhappy with it. And, and what's frustrating to me is that I'm like one of those people that I really like efficiency. I like, I, I hate throwing out stuff. I hate throwing out things that I've put work into and looking back at that and say, and feeling like I've lost an entire year's worth of work. I'm like, man, that's, that's like a book and a quarter of novels or like 10 novellas. I, mm-hmm. It just, oh, it, it definitely turns my stomach. Blimey. No, I mean, I've, I've been very lucky. I think there's, I, there's just, there's a sort of, I think a hermetic quality to the way um, I interact with my own imagination. That's, proved reasonably proof against um, those kind of changing external conditions. I mean, the most that tends to happen is the actual, the topics and the things I want to say in a book are going to get influenced by what's going on. But thus far, that's, that's from a pure creativity point of view, that's worked entirely positively because it's just, you know, all right, this is, this is giving me something I want to say. Well, and you, um, you, you're incredibly prolific, like just looking into the amount because I, I hadn't, um, when, when I invited you on, I, I, I realized that I hadn't really kept track. I read, um, your, uh, very first book, uh, empire in black and gold. Oh, thank you. Um, before I was published. Um, and I, and I think maybe before you had anything out, it was recommended to me, like right when I got out of college and I read it and I really enjoyed it. And I was like, I, I don't really think I know what else he's been working on. And I went and looked through and you've got so much that you've done over the last 15 years. Like it's remarkable. Do you feel like you write a lot that you discard or do you feel like most of what you write ends up published? So uh, it basically comes down to what you were saying about it's, it's an efficiency thing. Um, I plan a great deal and probably for that, and I, I will build a great deal before I write. And probably for those reasons, my first draft and my submission draft are very, very similar. Um, I will do a full sort of editing pass and tighten things up, but usually I don't end up changing anything significant um, to, you know, to the plot character structure wise. Um, unless things have gone horribly wrong, which has been the case in a couple of in a couple of books, so I don't write more, I suspect, in a day or a week than most writers. But I keep a great deal more of what I write, and yes, I, I'm kind of reliant on being able to write a draft, tidy it up, send it off, and then go on to another project. Yeah, and and when you send it off, you you usually feel pretty confident that you're going to get paid for that you think uh yes i mean i i on that which is which is very much um a reflection of just where i am in the business at the moment i think so currently pretty much everything i'm writing is under contract and you know obviously things come back with edits from the the publisher but they usually again they're not usually at a structural level they are (laughs) i um i mean i had with the third architects book there was actually a bit of a structural thing that they came back and said this bit doesn't work you know why the character's doing this and the annoying thing was i was kind of aware of that and i had kidded myself that it wasn't a problem because you know you 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 it's hard to tell when you're that close to something whether it is or not so it's just like i just, it was very much kind of ah you caught me <laughs> and i had to go back and rewrite sort of three or four chapters and that was annoying but usually um it you know the the edits are much more at a line level I've, and um yeah i i've definitely had that experience of of but you know what? Maybe, maybe she won't notice that this isn't as good as it should be, even though I totally know it is. Yeah, and they always do. <laughs> yeah. But um, other, I mean, other than that, um, I'm either writing for something that's under contract or because of the amount of professional momentum I've got, I'm writing something that's on spec, but I'm, I can be very confident that someone is going to pick it up. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, that's a good place to be. I mean, I do feel like there is this there's this kind of balance where like, like you had alluded to earlier, I think all, all writers, all professional writers are very aware that their next book might not sell, or even if it does sell, it might not sell to the general public. Mm. Um, But you also kind of, you also kind of develop an instinct for your own audience and what you feel like people are going to enjoy. And, uh, and you kind of know if you're kind of going outside of those bounds, if you're kind of staying within them. And, uh, and I, that's a, it's a really, it's a weird thing to try to describe to people who don't do this professionally, because we, it it is, it's all kind of gut instinct. It's not something you can really measure, you know, like if you're an accountant, you know, if you're a good accountant or not, because you're not 
getting the numbers wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's that's exactly it. And I do I do try and push the the boundaries of that sort of territory because obviously if you write a book that you know was a bit of a risk and then that book does all right, then you've you've claimed that new territory. You know, well I can write a book in, in that space and it's it's gonna work. And yeah, I mean that was that was children of time, to be honest. I was I was reasonably you know, I was moderately successful as a fantasy writer and I wanted to write this science fiction book about spiders. And it was very much a case of the publishers going, oh, well, go on then, go on. <laughs> you know, if it'll keep you happy, just go back to the fantasy after that, because that's kind of what what's, we know we can sell. And then Children of Time became this this enormous left wing, left, left, wing, left field. <laughs> so, so, may or may not be a left wing success, um, but this all left field success and, um, you know, did, did so well in the, the Clark Awards. And it's kind of flipped now so that now I'm the science fiction writer and I have to fight quite hard to get a fantasy book out like they you know i've got my first fantasy book out for years um coming out in in december and that's that was genuinely quite a struggle to find a place for because that's not what they think they can sell from me anymore oh, but gosh, um that's got to be strange because because like you earned your kind of street cred by writing fantasy and you earned the ability to be able to hand them a science fiction book by writing a bunch of fantasy that came out and did well. And then suddenly to have that flipped on its head, that's got to be very strange to you. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's been fun to, you know, I've, I've, I've got a lot of sci-fi out there now and it's, 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 a space I enjoy working in, but I also like the freedom of being able to go back and just do some, you know, full on freestyle world creation as a, a fantasy author. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted I've been able to actually get a fantasy book out after all this time, because you, know, you do get, you, it's very first world problems, but when you are doing well in a particular type with a particular type of book, that type of book is what publishers want from you. And I, I, yeah, I mean, I can hardly complain because they, they have done very well for me, but sometimes it's nice to do something with magic. You know? <laughs> right. I do love that. Hey, page break listeners, Brian here, rudely interrupting myself for a bit of a plug. Making a podcast isn't free, and I'm hoping that you enjoy it enough to pitch in a pittance. To do so, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak, where you can toss as little as $3 a month into the tip jar, $5 a month to get the podcast ad-free and early, and $10 a month to hear your name in the credits and feel a smug sense of superiority. You can also buy my books from your favorite retailer, or direct from my website. Thanks to everyone who contributes. Now back to me! Um, so tell me a little bit about studying zoology, because like your insects, insects are a major part of your like whole body of work. Um, and I'm I'm kind of wondering, I'm kind of wondering where like where that comes from, where the kind of fascination with the natural world and it kind of intersecting with your you know science fiction and fantasy writing where does that come from? Is that from your childhood? Is that from, you know, your studies? Um, <laughs> I almost feel that there's a, there's a joke in there that, you know, sort of there was George R. R. Martin, there was me in, in the room. We were being told this is the future of fantasy. And he heard incest and I heard insect and he got Game of Thrones out of it. And I, <laughs> I got the shadows of the ant. Um, I, I just, so I grew up with um, nature documentaries. I grew up with David Attenborough. Um, I, the natural world has always been, had enormous kind of territory staked out in my imagination and my subconscious. And so it's really, it's not that I write about insects because I studied zoology. I, I put in for a zoology degree. Um, and in fact, only got a year into that before I switched to full psychology because I frankly could not handle the dissections. Um, but that became because I had that pre existing interest. And the pre existing interest was also very much in basically the kinds of animals that other people do not like. So insects, spiders, octopuses, reptiles, all, all of that sort of thing. Um, I, I've always had this very powerful kind of. Um, identification with the other which is kind of you know it's one of the things you get when you're a, you're a weird kid with a relatively small number of friends um <laughs> you know growing up you just like well this is my tribe people don't like them either <laughs> so um but 
I mean, academically, I'm not quite sure what I got out of university because, like I say, the zoology, I just did not have, A, I didn't have the manual dexterity, and B, we did literally one lecture on insects, and it was, this is how we kill insects, and that was not really what I was there for. Uh, the, the psychology side of things came down to, this is how you do very complicated st statistics. We will teach you nothing about how people think. So what I did get from university was a lot of very, very useful sort of social grounding. Um, which I absolutely feel was worth, worth that time because it kind of finished finished me as a human being. Um, but uh, yeah, the I think the the driving interest in that sort of thing predated the degree, and certainly I, I've built far more on the things I have personally gone out to learn and set out to learn, and you know, and picked up from my own researches than rather than anything I was really taught at um, at uh, university. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because I. I, I feel like I had kind of a similar experience, even though I, I went to school for something that ostensibly is pretty close to what I to end up writing. I mean, I was an English major, you know, which is that incredibly vague sort of, you know, study literature and and hope you can get a teaching job or something like that. <laughs> um, but uh, but even my creative writing classes, they were kind of divided between. The, the the kind of the small thinking uh let's teach you how to structure a, a short story versus um taking like brandon sanderson's class you know like i just happened to end up at school right before he made it just absolutely massive oh cool and um and so like like when i when people talk, ask me about oh how, what did you study in school you know what did you get out of it it's like I met my wife and I met Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> I, I literally have no memory of the rest of college. <laughs> and, and that's like, that's, it's such a weird thing to be like, ah, oh, yeah, school, I guess. I mean, I got a degree. I did graduate. It's, it's not really been useful to me. I mean, the, the, I, I know very few people who, who work in the field, they got their degree in. Um, I mean, I, I, a lot, I think that there is this idea of, well, you, if you've got a degree, if you've got an ology, as, as 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 was in a very old advert here in the in the UK, then you know that's kind of that's what you show to the employer that you've you've you had the gumption to get through and get get a de get a decent degree. And what the degree is in is maybe not that important unless you're going into something quite technical. Yeah, yeah. Unless you really need a specialized skill set that that someone taught you. Um, gosh, and even then, it does almost feel like you know, things have shifted to the point where you, for, for those specialized skill sets, you need, you need internships or you need some kind of uh, work experience in that, that, you know, you never know when you're a, you know, a practically a kid, you know, you're 18 to 20 uh, stumbling into the right kind of thing that maybe you're good at it. Maybe you're interested in it and maybe it actually pays well. Gosh. I mean, uh, that's one thing I look at and think I'm so glad that I don't have to work in a, like a, a real job market mm. because because publishing is weird. I, I tell everyone that publishing is a very strange profession, just in general, the whole area of expertise. But man, it just works for me. And and I, I, I don't even know how to describe why, even though I, I'm constantly bad mouthing it, <laughs> but it works for me and I do actually quite like it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's got pros and cons. I mean, it's one of those in my life, there's only one thing I've ever wanted to be. And I've been lucky enough that that's actually worked out for me. And I am that. And it's in general, actually the job, you know, the day job has always been more a matter of sort of making rent and, and you know, putting putting food on the table because, and in the background, I was always working towards or working at being a writer. So when when do you think that first kind of hit you of the I want to be a writer? Um, well, it was when I ran into the Dragonlance novels. So this is yeah, uh, Vice and Hickman, the original Dragonlance novels, which are if, if people don't know, they are they were some of the very very early Dungeons and Dragons uh, books put out by TSR. They were a write up of someone's role play campaign. I was a very very keen role player and have been for years. And my the same kind of creativity that would then later go into my actual prose writing was very much um, being honed in campaign create you know, world building and character building for game campaigns. And I would not have any at any point before those books have thought, oh, yes, I can be a writer, obviously, because these are these are useful skills for being a writer, because being a writer was something that and that some other class of person did that was that, you know, and obviously it didn't include just ordinary people. 
And then these books came out and they were very good books. And I still kind of, rem- I still remember them very fondly, but this the thing was they were books written by someone, people who had an enormous overlap of interest with me. And I thought, well, I can, I can do that. And you know, as it happened, I couldn't do that uh, because I was, <laughs> because writing is a craft and you need to work at it and get better at it. But that, that was almost like a permission moment of suddenly, yes, yeah, suddenly that door has just opened. You can actually aim at doing this for a living and all right, it's not going to be easy to do. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't easy to do, but the existence of those books removed this, what would other otherwise have been, I suspect an insuperable psychological block about all well, these is not a thing that it can really exist in my world. I, I really like what you said there about kind of the psychological permission. Um, because I, I think that's a, a really huge thing for, especially for young people is to be able to look at somebody and say, oh, they do something. They're, they're like me and they mm-hmm. do something that I aspire to. I mean, that can, that can drive like an entire person's life from just that one moment. Uh, and I find that really fascinating. I mean, this one thing, um, obviously big, topic at the moment is the idea of representation of different um um di- different demographic groups as protagonists in tv and film and books and so forth and that is one reason why that is so important because seeing yourself as the as the hero um is is a very empowering thing um whereas if you go through your life only seeing one particular kind of dem- demographic group given that role um, it's going to have a psychological effect. It's going to be, it's basically telling you, you know, this isn't for you. I mean, it's one, it's one reason why I'm, I'm generally fairly impatient with, um, like the promised prince or prophecy sort of plot line is they, this is the plot line where, which basically says, unless you're of this bloodline or unless you are specially selected by this kind of supernatural power, you're not allowed to be a hero. Whereas I prefer books where the heroes are very regular people who, who are thrust into those sort of situations and have to make the best of it. Yeah, I, I've always been very much drawn to to people who to heroes that are that are already exceptional because of who they are, just you know, their skills, their innate you know abilities, their innate their innate um, kind of uh, the things that they're just good at as human beings rather than because they were a prince, right? Mm. Or because, like you said, because you know some god ordained it, or something like that. Um, yeah, it's 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 weirdly depressing that there is still so much kind of hereditary heroism going on in sci-fi and fantasy. The idea that because you are of a certain particular family, that makes you very special, and you have the magic powers, and you can do the thing, and it's just ah. Uh... It's it's weirdly retrograde. Oh, I I definitely see I see why people really are drawn to it, um, both as writers and readers, because because there's something that's kind of almost uh, um, like a la- lazily escapist in the idea that you are preordained to be the hero. Um, you because you know someone told you that you're a hero and you get to be a hero. You don't have to earn it and. And so I kind of get it. I get why people like reading that kind of stuff, because this is an escape fantasy of you know, somebody coming along to them in their crappy, boring apartment with their crappy, boring job and saying, no, your life is going to all be different right now because I just arrived and told you it would be. Um, and everybody kind of kind of dreams of that kind of thing happening to them, you know, even though it really doesn't in real life. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a bit like those, um, you know, you, every so often when you see someone throw up on social media. So what do you think you would be doing if you were born in the middle ages and I was, Oh, I'd be, you know, Kings and Knights and this and the other. No, you'd, you'd have, you'd have died. You'd have died of some sort of very readily treatable disease because mm, the vast majority of people were peasant farmers. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, I mean, they, the, the escapist fantasy worked until you start to re- look at the odds and you realize actually, you know, that's if you have a world where this sort of thing goes on, the odds are vastly in favor of the person who is the prophesied hero, not being you. Yeah. And at that point, if that's not you, then your role in that world is almost certainly to get killed as some sort of cautionary tale by the bad guy. If you were really lucky, you would have get, to, you would have got to make shoes. And also, I mean, the other the other thing that tends to go hand in glove with that in in fantasy is there is only one character in those books who is actually interested in bucking the social order and making something of their lives, and they are the bad guy. Yeah, 
the idea that upset it, upsetting the natural order of um, you know the rich man and his in his castle and the poor man at his gate is in itself essentially evil is a very very um, insidious concept. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very kind of like when you dig into it, it like it, it very quickly becomes apparent how kind of uh, aristocratic that is. Yes. Um, <laughs> It's like, you know, anybody who's, as you said, upsetting the social order, trying to change things, you know, they automatically become evil. Yeah. And, and it's the thing, you know, there, there are reasons for it. And it get, you can draw a, very, a straight line from modern fantasy all the way back to things like Amadeus of Gaul and genuine medieval romances, which are written effectively by, uh, certainly for nobles and frequently by nobles. Um, but it's, you know, it is very much the exaltation of a certain social order, which is at least reasonably receding into the past, uh, although I'm living in a country which seems to be trying to bring it back half the time. <laughs> well, and it's, it is it is a weird thing to try to kind of engage with as a modern person, because you, like I, I'm at least in my experience, like I, like the US, you know, we have plenty of our own problems with kind of celebrity worship and things like that. But at least to me, like the idea of, of aristocrats is very weird. And I mean, personally, the, the idea of celebrity worship is very weird as well, but, you know, we still do that plenty. Um, I mean, honestly, I mean, aristocracy is just the social codification of um, any kind of power imbalance. And I, it's, it's one of those things that if you, if you look at how it comes apart, it, it comes together. It comes together because the people who have the, the money and or swords um, become aware that actually it would be a lot easier if people just accepted that we were here and therefore we could spend our money and not have to hit them with the swords. And if you have the swords and tell people that, uh, you know, you have a divine right of kings or you, or, you know, in some other way, it is, this is the way that the world is supposed to be. Eventually you get to enjoy your money and sword without having to constantly um, sort of wash the, wash the blood off your hands and go along for an, an enough hundred years. And it's almost unthinkable that um, it, things could be any other way. Right. It, I, I think about sometimes how, how you look at those kind of the lines of kings, you know, in Europe. And and if you just keep following the trail backwards, you eventually end up with a group of guys who all kind of decided that they were going to just rule this one area. And and they, they kind of agreed, OK, you you are one buddy that is charismatic or smart or some reason why we are gathering around you. We're going to call you king and the people that you make in the future your descendants are going to be king and let's in fact let's just say that god's god decided that you're king and it's just at, at its basic level it's just pro propaganda that kind of ends up snowballing over the course of generations yeah and i mean the actual the the historical process involved if you look at you know the Europe in the early Middle Ages, so after you know, after the Roman Empire has collapsed, and you have all of these individuals with, you know, they might have a couple of hundred people with swords, and they've got an area that they nominally control, and they're all jockeying with for position. Then you have the church, and the church has a certain amount of learning, and the church has a certain amount of money, and the church doesn't want people to come and take the money. So they say, well, what if we support you and say God likes you and um, and wants you to be in charge. Uh, and in return, you don't take all the church's money and you have all this, this peculiar horse trading going on. But at the time, everything's very fluid. You know, if you're a person and you're good and you've got a sword, it doesn't really matter who you are or where you're born. If you're good enough throwing it around, you can be one of the elite because having that sword is all that counts. And then you fast forward it a few centuries. And yes, it's all to, yes, you've got to be born to this, this particular uh, set of, a small set of families. And you can't just, you know, the, the longer things go on, the less social mobility there is. And it takes a very long time for that thing to crack open. Uh, in most places, there are, very, there are very few areas which look at things even slightly different. I mean, you have places in Italy where there's an ability, but there isn't a, there isn't a king and things are more kind of oligarchic, perhaps. But it's still, you know, there, there's still, it still makes, I suspect, very little difference for the person at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And you, you have to take into account all sorts of things with that whole structure. Um, you have to take into account education. You know, of course, you know, if, if people, if people don't know any better, if people don't, you know, if people can't even read the average person, then, mm. you know, how do they know that this guy who lives up on the hill, you know, isn't ordained by God? 
you know, or, you know, if they don't know genealogy, if they don't know history, if they only know what's told to them by their local priest or by their Lord, then that's it. Like that's fact in their minds. And, and, and as somebody who grew up with the internet, it just absolutely blows my mind. But even, I mean, even, even now, I think you, it's amazing that, you know, we, we've had a, at least a couple of centuries of this particular thing being in theoretically in the rear view mirror. And I think even now, an awful lot of people have this very ingrained idea that there are basically, there are better people and worse people, and you can have a particular destiny and a particular family might be entitled to have a kind of a hereditary succession or power or celebrity or whatever. And the problem is from the outside, you know, you see, oh, this, this, this person is terribly important. And then their son has also become a terribly important person. And it's easy to see how that kind of idea of, well, they're obviously just a very, very blessed family. Um, because what you're not seeing is the enormous exercise of money and influence that is ensuring that each generation of that family does terribly well. Um, and I have a horrible feeling that that kind of, that kind of divine right of kings sort of situation is very much where a, a certain sort of proportion of people in the world would like to take us back to. Because at that point, you know, it's very easy. To, it's much simpler to hold on to your power when you've got that unthinking assumption that a certain a certain bloodline or a certain type of person is meant to be in charge. Yeah, yeah, and 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 obviously, you, you know, we all know why the people on top want that to be the case. But then you look at the people kind of that you know vote for them or follow them or whatever, and and it's I, I find it interesting trying to kind of dissect that kind of stuff. And I uh, I don't know. I think that. I think that there is a there is a simplicity in the idea of you know divine right or you know or similar theories that that people can latch onto really easily and just say the world is complicated mm-hmm. let's let this other guy make the decisions. Yes and I mean I think that's you know that the world is complicated is makes your life more difficult. If you accept a simple version of the world that is full of absolutes, because the world itself is notably short on absolutes, then your life can be very easy. If you just say, right, whatever this person says is right, that does relieve you of a lot of anxiety and worry and depression. And you can say, well, obviously I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing what this person says, and they are the person who is supposed to be in charge. Yes, I mean, it's it's one of those, it doesn't all come down to the fact that, well, obviously this one group of person has the sword and the other person group of people don't. It's, it's you do... And you know, it's certainly it's historically one a one group of people that has fought most fiercely for the status quo have frequently been the people right at the bottom, especially kind of rural um rural agricultural demographics. If you look at like the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution and so forth, they pushed back pretty damn hard against anyone trying to change society because well that yeah and weirdly it's it it is also it's specifically a so I don't know if we're going wildly off topic with this. But, um, no, I love this kind of stuff. I, and you know what? My listener can listen to whatever the heck because <laughs> it, they can change the channel if they want. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a king thing as well. I mean, historically, you have this weird thing that the 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 peasants complain, but they complain against their landlords and they complain against the aristocracy as a whole, but they absolutely don't complain against the king. Yeah. In fact, frequently, uh, even when you have actual peasants revolts, the peasants are revolting for the king, but against everyone who is between them and the king, that kind of structure of, um, sort of merchants and landlords and tax collectors and dukes and earls and so forth. But the king, you know, God forbid, the king is obviously on their side. It's just that they are very poorly advised. That tends to be the, the language that, te- that is, that is, um, used and frequently, um, peasants revolts have, you know, peasant revolts have historically dismantled themselves when the actual king came and told them, yes, you're all lovely people. Of course I will do this thing. Just put away all the swords and bows and pitchforks. And needless to say, those peasants have been very powerfully disappointed with what happened next. But it is this idea that, well, it's obviously, you know, despite the fact that the king is normally in charge, it's obviously not the king who is to blame for all the problems we've got. It must be everyone else. The cult of personality is enormously powerful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's a it's a cultivated propaganda that that the king is, you know, the king is the father. You know, the king is the your God's representation mm-hmm. um, who will who who, if he had the time, would come and tuck your children in every single night. <laughs> um, you know, like there's definitely you get that vibe out of those historical revolutions 
I, I find that really interesting. And there's some places where you kind of, it's really interesting when you run into those historical time periods where that that's not actually super far from the truth, where you have a king who, who historians will agree was a reasonably decent guy, but living in a complicated time that he just could not handle the logistics of. And I find that kind of stuff really interesting where, where you do have like the whole noble system, the, the, the system of nobility and feudalism or vaguely feudalistic societies they're so incredibly complicated because it's it's based more off of interpersonal relationships than it is off of actual rule of law and all that and it goes so back and forth yeah i mean it's it you that you do get the sense of people feeling they had this personal relationship with the monarch uh because he was their monarch he, and he was um, the divine appointment that kind of puts them in a particular place where they're the chain going from god to the king to all of the people under that king's king's domain um, in a way that kind of skips over the various intervening um, social strata. And it, it's interesting because you can see now people who kind of act as if they have that personal relationship with a celebrity or with a politician or with a tech billionaire or something like that. They have that idea that I, I must personally stand up and defend this person against all of the all of their their critics because they are they are my person and I will I will fight in their corner. Um, despite the fact that that person individual in question has no concept of that that individual exists and wouldn't care if they if 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 they did. Oh, good lord! There's um there's a line in Henry V when they are tallying up the casualties of the Battle of Agincourt and they name about oh yes we've lost this duke and this earl and this this person and then so many hundred of the lesser sort and that's kind of you know that's all the vast majority of people are to kings or to tech billionaires or to, or to whatever is just, you're the lesser sort. You're there basically to die in the trenches. Right. Um, to achieve a thing. You're there to be thrown at the enemy en masse to achieve a thing, whether it's on social media or on a battlefield. Um, but yes, if they could, if they have somehow persuaded you that they have this deep and abiding personal, personal, uh, care for your well being and your, your sort of spiritual well being or physical or whatever, then that's obviously terribly convenient for them. <laughs> right. It, it, it does feel like a, it's like a sports team sort of mentality. Like it's, it's our guy, you know, even when, even when he sucks, he's still our guy. It's a very tribal thing. Yeah. Um, and human psychology is very, very vulnerable to that. Um, it's what I think makes religions work a lot of the time. It's what makes people rapidly root for a, like you say, a team or a political party or something like that, where you get to the point where it doesn't really matter what is being done or said in the name of that. It's the fact that that is your tribe, that is your flag, that is your whatever. And, you know, the whole my country, right or wrong subdivide into so many other aspects of life and it's you know it's, it's it's the reason why people have enormous um screaming fits about um star wars for example yeah to take one of the most device divided fandoms and the fact you know and you get to a point well no i am obviously for this film and not for that film in the canon because that is my my standpoint and that is that is what my people say and it and it is it's amazing how quickly radicalized people can become over what it, over even incredibly trivial things so i suppose it's not really surprising they get ready they, they get similarly kind of fanatical about theoretically large real world things as well you were mentioning how people develop a belief that they have a personal relationship with a particular celebrity or a sports team or whatever. And it, I think comes about down to the, that person, that person has developed a personal relationship with something they heard or something that touched them, mm -hmm. a game they saw or a speech they listened to. They developed a personal relationship with that. And then it kind of imprinted onto the person themselves. And then it's weirdly psychological from there. And I think in, in the modern day, it must be far more powerful than, you know, all right, you maybe you may, might have seen the king when you were in an enormous crowd and they were just this, this, this very fancy hat somewhere over there. Nowadays, you hear the voice and the voice. I mean, it is very hard to remind myself that I do not personally know a, you know, a succession of podcasters and Twitch streamers and so forth, because I am very used to having their voice in my company. I'm very used to, you know, or it, it gives you a sense of very physical closeness and it gives you, and they are talking to you. And the fact that they're talking also to several thousand other people at the same time, um, doesn't really matter. So they, they, it is, 
we are not really psychologically set up for a world containing the number of people our worlds currently contact. And it, it short circuits are kind of the wiring of the human brain in a number of awkward and fascinating ways. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've definitely like run into that psychological problem of, of like, Oh yeah. Dan Carlin is my buddy. Cause I've listened <laughs> to his voice for 150 hours. <laughs> And, and you can easily see why, especially like early broadcasters, like why they became like voices of a nation, yeah. you know, because absolutely. Yeah. Everyone was listening to them at 7 PM on a Tuesday night. Yeah. And I think that there is, there's some part of human psychology that gives so much weight just purely to that hearing someone's voice. It is, it is one of the most intrinsically human things that just vocal verbal communication is an enormous part of what makes us human. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Well, we, um, we've got just a bit more time. I actually really wanted to have you tell me because, because this will, this podcast will be coming out at either the week of, or somewhere really close to your new book. Um, so tell me a little bit about city of last chances. Oh, right. I was about to say which book, because my new book can cover a a variety of texts, depending on precisely when we're talking. So city of last chances is, um, it is a, the fantasy city book I've wanted to write for years in that it is a story about ordinary people living lives in a fairly high magic fantasy city. It's kind of fantasy industrial revolution stuff, except the, the industry is all powered by demons. And it's an occupied city, um, so I'm very much drawing on Casablanca here and um, the, the Korean series Chicago Typewriter, which has the same same kind of vibe. And there's a revolution brewing, and the protagonists. It's a big cast of interweaved, tangled, tangled life stories about people trying not to be heroes in a fantasy book because that gets you killed. And so they are. There are students, and there are academics, and there are um, sort of effect, well, effectively trade unionists. Because there is this sort of burgeoning labor rights movement in this in this in this very industrial city, and there are thugs, and there are there are sort of there's a pawnbroker and an innkeeper, and all these just very normal people. Uh, although all of their trades are kind of skewed by the fact that it's quite a magical city, and they are trying not to be involved. And there is a very very valuable thing that the occupiers have lost, which has gone missing, and some of them may or may not have it. And it's just the story of living in the city, which is an absolute powder keg and watching it explode in real time um, by people who do not have the means and wherewithal to get out from under that explosion. Uh, It's also, it's a book where my writing process was quite different because I created the world, but I did not plan out the plot. I just let my characters go and live their lives and do that thing, do their thing rather, as, um, as events accelerate around them. And that was quite hair raising to do because I had no idea whether the book would come together or whether it would be kind of hit the thousand page mark and still be going strong. But as it happened, it all, the shape of it worked absolutely perfectly and everything came together really nicely without me having to force anything and all of the characters get to do their thing. And it, yeah, I, I, I think I had more fun writing this book than I've had, had with, with anything for a very long time. Do you think that's because you didn't plot it out? Um, it was, I mean, Yes, I think that was just it was a bit of a roller coaster and you know in in a in a bad way but also in a in a good way and it did mean that every time it kind of went whoosh and then just kind of <laughs> um came up for another go around that was that was a whole extra level of um excitement and uncertainty that I've not really had before and then obviously when I when it came around to the end and it gets good everything has actually worked and none of the plates have fallen off and it's all sort of come around and all make sense and it balances. I was, I was just kind of amazed to be honest, because I'm, I'm so used to planning things out to within an inch of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. And that's out in uh, December 8th, right? I believe so. Certainly in the UK, I'm not quite sure um, about the US, but hopefully around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. That always, honestly, that always drives me a little nuts when the, when they release something in the U S and UK on different days, it just it's like, come on guys. It's all the English speaking world kind of thing release the coordinate the releases yeah i mean it's uh i think with that so that's published by head of zeus and their 
their back catalogue. I mean, the physical books were available in the States, but the, for a long time, the e-books and audio weren't. And as far as I'm aware, those are now all available. So I'm hoping the new book will also just be a, a reasonably simultaneous release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, very cool. Good luck with that one. Thank you. Um, I really love the cover of that. That looked very cool. It's it's one of one of the nicest covers um, any of my books have had, and also the the particularly flattering as a writer. All the little details on the cover relate to the book. It's not just like here is some random random fantasy stuff or the random city stuff. Everything there, you know, there is there there is there is a vulture on the cover, and that's because one of the uh, resistance factions has the vulture as their badge, and so all all of that stuff on the cover is related to little details in the book which is really fun yeah yeah it's i I think most uh readers would be shocked to realize just how um generic a lot of fantasy marketing marketing tends to be um Mm -hmm. i mean they it generally there is um the idea is you want a book that will tell readers what sort of book they're getting so that they can buy it in confidence. No, you know, this book has a spaceship and a planet. It's going to be a spaceship and planet sort of book. Um, and that obviously does work extremely well as mark as, as marketing, but yes, it, it's always nice when you get that, when it goes that extra mile, sorry, it's the right kind of spaceship and the planet is the right color. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, I like to end this podcast by asking every guest the same question, a little bit out of left field, but What's the last thing that you ate that blew your mind? Oh, the last thing that I ate that blew my mind. Um, mm-hmm. There is a Vietnamese restaurant um, that's like two doors down from Games Workshop in Leeds. <laughs> Uh, so no, no, no prizes for guessing why I was in that part of town, uh, but <laughs> that we, uh, my wife and I ate there not that long ago. And I cannot for the life of me remember what the, the dish was. It was kind of, um, it was a, a, a sort of pork and rice sort of dish, but that was really very good. <laughs> so, so apologies for the vagueness, but that's, that's, that's what, what popped into my head when you asked the question. Oh, no, that's great. I, I, I love a good, I, I love a good kind of, I mean, in, in the U S it always feels so generically Asian, but you know, that's kind of how it's sold to us. Right. Mm. Like, um, but I love a good Asian dish, like something with like, like, like noodles or rice, uh, some kind of, some kind of really sauce that I don't really get normally in my day to day life. And then, you know, and then some kind of meat, I just, you know, that mix, it, it just, it always lands with me. Like one of my favorite things is just a regular, like teriyaki chicken bowl. Um, mm-hmm. and it just, it always just hits the spot for me. Big fan. Yeah, no, I, uh, so certainly, I mean, um, Thai and Vietnamese and Korean and Chinese and Japanese cuisine. I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. That was author Adrian Tchaikovsky. Thanks again to Adrian for coming on to chat. You can find Adrian's social media down in the show notes. You can find me as always at brianmcclellan.com. As a quick reminder, jump onto Kickstarter to support my new Glass Immortals novella, Montego. Special thanks to James Sutter for music and Tom Bishop for production. If you'd like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash page break or buy my books in ebook, paperback, or audio. You can also get signed copies of my books direct from my website or swag from my Redbubble store. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. If you're listening to this via Patreon, please stick around for bonus chat during the epilogue. Special thanks to Elijah, Ivor Gullickson, James Clark, Jennifer Johnson, Jason Nall, Kyle Anderson, Sexton Hardcastle, Talon, Brian, and Will Lebelski for their backing on Patreon. <laughs>